ever enjoying it. This is my fourth time around this place. Always a boss out here in Caesars. So, um, what am I here to do? I'm here to give you guys a talk about some uh, new ways to manipulate networks, new ways to manipulate clients, servers, and whatnot. Um, something going on? Ah. Funny you should uh, bring this up. This is not going to be a normal talk where I just go on and blather and whatnot and you either absorb it or you don't. Um, I'm all into that whole audience participation thing. So listen, um, let yourself get annoyed at what I say, get pissed off, figure out the holes, and if I like them, you'll get stuff. That's how I work. Um, <laughs> There are absolutely attacks against some of the things I'm going to mention. Hopefully, some of you will figure them out before I even bring them up. So, let's go ahead and start out. My philosophy of security, peace through superior firepower. Um, I kind of have a problem with the concept that attackers are the only people who get to play with fun toys. Um, I actually have a problem with attacking, not in the sense that, you know, how dare you go break into a machine, but like, Buffalo overflows are 30 years old, they're older than I am, it's time to move on. So um, came up with this talk last year called Black Ops of TCP IP, which apparently people liked. Um, it was the precursor to a set of tools known as the Paketo Kiwetsu. And uh, I'm hoping I pronounced that right. I'm sure there's a Japanese individual in the audience who will loudly correct me if I'm wrong. Um, had a bunch of tools for various strange modal modalities of network manipulation. Uh, scan ran a vast port scanner, minute a implementation of NAT, and so on. So the goal was to bring new tools to the table, keeping with the primary advantage of the defender, which is basically there's no need for stealth when you're on defense. Um, ScanRan is a very loud port scanner. Stealthy it ain't. When you're dropping, uh, I don't know, 60,000 packets a second, it's not that hard to get noticed, people. I mentioned this because I saw one review of ScanRan, and they're like, wow, this is really stealthy. I'm like, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so if this thing will actually advance the slide. Aha. That was the past. This is the present. As promised, code, actual code, and a link to the slightly updated slides. No, I didn't go ahead and make all your books useless, but I did go ahead and add a little bit of extra context based off what some people had mentioned. So that's where to get the code described in this talk. Well, most of it. I forgot the SSL dump patch, but you'll hear about that later. Um, that's where to get the code. And that's where to get the slides. And I'll leave that up for a minute for those who wish to write it down or whatnot. <whistles> Everyone got that? Who cares? Everyone? Bueller? Okay. Now I do have to mention this is not this is not Paketo 2. This is not 2.0, this is 1.99. There are missing tools, there are chunks that did not make it. The distribution as is is Linux specific. Um, for those who don't know, by the way, about Nopix STD, um, Nopix as a whole is a Linux distribution that runs from CD. STD, the security tools distribution, horribly named, my god. <laughs> I've got STDs. <laughs> no, um, no, but it's actually a really, really well done and useful distribution. So I've been using this for a lot of my development and just thought I'd mention that because that may be one of the few distros that built on it. I'm hoping not. I've tested it around a bit, but anyway. So we are going to go a little bit out of order. This is the only out of order in the entire uh, slides. And why did I start with layer seven, the generic ActiveX encapsulation hack? Really simple. It's the simplest thing I brought up and it has nothing to do with TCP IP. This is completely different than the rest of the talk, but it's a really cool hack. I've been using this for like two years. And I finally decided, okay, I might as well go ahead and share it. So what am I talking about? Is it possible to use ActiveX to deploy something besides spyware? Well, I know, or else you know, you'd see other things besides spyware and you know, I don't know, the occasional macromedia flash install. Um, check this out, guys. Oh, yeah, you see all those windows down there? Yeah, that's what I was furiously typing. I'm actually doing live demos here today. So that means I have like eight SSH sessions open for all these things. 
actually navigating this, not going to be fun, but hopefully you guys will enjoy the result. Now, if I can get a web server up, and people aren't hijacking links, please don't hijack my link. I need that. That means you. So we go over to docsparrow.com apps too. Well, actually, I think it's just apps now. So these are various applications. Now, I wonder what, they, what happens if I click on them. Let's go ahead and click on Putty. We get this little window. Do you want to run the Putty SSH client? I say yes. Hey, look, it's a SSH client out of a web page. It turns out ActiveX, which you know theoretically you're supposed to take like an OCX file and uh, pack it up and you know, specifically program it to be run off a web page. Yeah, that's not entirely mandatory. You can pretty much take any Windows program put it into an object in an HTML page, sign it correctly, and it'll load. In fact, if you go, we go ahead and we look at the source for this page, which I have no idea is even going to be readable. Now, you see how there's this class ID down here? Windows doesn't care. <laughs> it doesn't, whatever. It's got an .exe file. It doesn't care either. It just works. And I, so I've actually put together a decent little collection of toys. You know, we've got our... Uh, a uh, PMON, a packet monitor, made a pad, a little text editor. Pora, where you push some guy down a flight of stairs. No, I'm actually serious. That's actually the point of the game. Um, this is basically my way of saying, you know, if ActiveX is going to be insecure, can't it at least be useful? <laughs> this may be the happiest security advisory you will ever receive. <laughs> okay, we got a question already. Go ahead, shout it out. How far is it? Ah, perfect question. Makes me so happy with these slides that I wrote. Here's what you do. <laughs> well, uh, so, so I actually, uh, after this talk, I'll go ahead and I'll put up a link to all the tiny little executables that you need. First you make a cert. You've got like, I don't know, 15 characters to type. Then you have to convert it to, to an SPC file. And it's like, what, 10 characters? And then you run this really big and scary sign code. And it doesn't really matter what the app is. You know, the, just so you know, the dash N is the name when it said putty SSH client. I say random file. The timestamp is interesting. VeriSign will actually stamp arbitrary data. Say, whatever it is you just sent me, I saw it at this time. This happens to be a really cool public service. People should use it more. Like, you know, you have a message. You want to prove that you uh, had it signed at a certain time? VeriSign will sign it for you. This is very nice. Good job, guys. Oh, here at the end, you name like you're executable. And then your HTML, I know, big and complicated. But you see that class ID? Remember, not checked. Now, that's all you have to do, but this isn't interesting. Why is this not interesting? Because if I just go ahead and I put a link and I say the A, the href is an executable file, Outlook Express will say, that's a really nice executable. Do you want me to run this executable? At the end of the day, it's an equal number of clicks. Now, let's say I had a valid certificate signing, you know, I was a... By the way, you can't actually get a valid certificate for software publishing. You have to be publishing spyware to get one of those certificates. <laughs> I wish I was kidding. <laughs> now, that's not inter this is not interesting. It's still just one click. Whether it's a valid cert, an invalid cert, or if you just throw the exe onto, a, uh, onto an href. That, so this isn't cool. Ah, but this is. A lot of Windows applications require support files. Like, um, oh, this is going to take a minute, but why not? So a lot of Windows applications require support files. They're not just a single executable. This is often a pain. You know, you, you have to you know, get the file, unzip it, put it somewhere temporary, or even worse, have to run an installer, it throws crap in your start menu. Like, all this stuff you gotta do just because you wanted, you know, a stupid little Windows app for a minute. So, check this out. You know, before I showed you Putty, yeah, this is a full-on Sigma distribution that I put together. It's like about two and a half megs. And uh, as you can see, it has uh, lots of files, you know. Here's what you do. 
Windows has a built-in archive format. It's called CAB. You should be familiar with this because all your Windows apps are in CABs. Or all your Windows installs in CABs. Well, what you do is you take your CAB. CABs can be signed. You sign the CAB. But before you sign the CAB, you put in an INF file. And the INF file says, here's how you should set up this application. Now, the syntax is obscure, but all you really got to pay attention to is right here. The hook, the, the run extractor startup. That's it. You just say, you know, here's what you got to do to start up my application. While the app's running, all the files will be locked so they won't go away. The user closes the app. The temporary setup directory, which happens to be running your nice, useful executable like the SIG one we just saw, sticks around or gets, gets, gets deleted. And to generate a cab, I know it's another 10 characters, but I think we can all survive. So that's it. This is cool because this lets you go ahead and take really complicated apps and just sort of shove them on a web page. It's fun. So that's nice. Let's go screw with the net. Um, so is it possible to acquire a usable IP address on a network that lacks a DHC, DHCP server? Yeah, it's possible. It's not as easy as I thought it would be when I shoved that description into the Black Hat thing. Oh, well, they bought it. <laughs> So the classic, no, no, don't worry, I have something really cool for you guys, you'll like it. So the classic approach, you sniff the network, you look for broadcast of that ARP addresses, or you look for ARPs, you look for basically people saying, hey, hello, you know, what MAC address has this IP? And you basically, you know, you see a couple of these and you find a gap and you go ahead and you send out your own request, hello, does anyone have this IP address? And if nobody has it, you go ahead and you take it. This has been done a thousand times, this is done that by everybody. For those who aren't familiar with how ARP works, ARP is basically the way you go from some globally valid IP address, or at least some IP address, since not all of them are globally valid, and you get to something that actually makes sense on Ethernet. Because on Ethernet, you don't get from one place to another with an IP address. You get there with a MAC address. So what you basically do is you say, you know, hey, I'm going to go to somewhere local, so how do I get there locally? Think of it kind of like, you know, I, I, I'm going to explain this for a second for those in the audience who don't entirely know because some of the later stuff really gets messy. I'll explain this. Okay. You can kind of think of local routing versus remote routing as taking a cab to somewhere in the town to taking a cab to the airport. If you're going in town, you're just going to take a cab. If you're going to the airport, you're still going to take a cab, but you're going to take a cab to the airport, which has much better capacity for getting you from point A to point you know, Zimbabwe. So Ethernet's pretty much the same way. For local traffic, you're going to use the cab. You're going to use the cab no matter what. But if you're going to somewhere local, you're going to tell the cab driver where locally to take you. If you're going somewhere remote, you're always going to tell them to go to the airport. So that's the analogy for you to work with. Now here's some sort of new techniques that are maybe a little bit known, but not too much. First of all, um, routers will route. The airport has more taxis, is kind of the initial, is kind of the analogy here. You can send a packet. You know, you, you could have just sent it directly to the right MAC address. No, no, no. But instead, you're gonna send this packet to the router, the equivalent of the airport, and it's going to bounce off the router and go where it should have gone originally. Now, why is this useful? Because one of the things we have to do when we're on a random network is we need to see, is this a router? Is this going to go ahead and send packets places? So what we do is we basically, you know, we, we found a free IP, but there's a bunch of different IPs out there. and We don't know which one is, um, we don't know which one's a router or not. Basically, what we do is we spoof a packet from, uh, how do I explain this? We basically send a packet to ourselves, spoofed from someone else, but we send it to each of the MAC addresses that we've seen on the network. And whichever packet bounces off what we now detect as the router and hits us, we now know if we send it packets, these packets will go onwards and upwards to some you know, site that we wish to go to. Hallelujah. Um, and you can use subnet detection in somewhat of a similar way. Basically, the router is only going to ARP and only going to send you back the packet if you're in its subnet. 
or else it's going to go to its default gateway. So the end result being you um, basically try, you know, you keep doubling your range of IPs that you're trying. You eventually see, oh, okay, so this router is willing to send me packets if I'm between here and here. But if I get over here, I, it's not going to send it to me anymore. So this is nice for figuring out where you're able to go ahead and stick your IP. Now there's a problem. What if, <laughs> a couple people should like this, what if you can't go ahead and uh, find any new IPs? What if they're all taken? This is not a theoretical problem. I wanted an IP address the other day from this network and Ping comes to me and says, no, 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 no. All the exhibitors have all the IPs, it's all done. I'm like, oh, <laughs> that's not that much of a problem actually. So let me talk a little bit about how NAT works. We've talked about how ARP works. We need to talk about how, well, there's one piece of ARP I should mention. The man in the middle attack in ARP, very simple. You have a client and a router. You tell the router that you're the client. You tell the client that you're the router. You sit in the middle and you pass the packets. This is, I mean, it's, it's straight classic technique, nothing new. NAT. Also nothing new. The idea with NAT is, is that there's only one IP that the outside world wants to be seeing traffic from, but you got a bunch of hosts. So what do you do? You, you receive traffic from the hosts. When you send it out, you keep track of what you sent out. And if you get a reply back to anything you sent out, you, you translate it back to who made the request. So it's like, you know, someone makes an outgoing request to Yahoo. When you get a reply back from Yahoo, you send it to the guy who requested a packet from Yahoo. And there are port numbers to make sure that two or three or eight or everyone on the network can go ahead and request the same website. Now, what would NAT in the middle be? Now, you know how I said that, uh, that NAT has an one, says there's only one externally trusted IP? There's only one address that the outside world wants to see? Well, you know how I said there's, a, the I, there's only a few IPs available on the network? Well, what I'm basically saying is um, there's only a couple IPs that the outside world wants to see and they're in use. So we'll just sort of borrow one. <laughs> Interject ourselves inside. So now we're going ahead, we're in between a client with a valid IP address, which is what Nat wants. We have a client, we have a router. We stick ourselves in the middle. Now, we have our hosts that want to go ahead and communicate through this guy over here's IP. So they, you know, they, they have their own IP range, they send packets to my man in the middle, and he goes, oh, okay. Nats them to the client's IP address, sends them out. No, no, so they're, they're all out, right? Bunch of packets come back. Some of them bear no resemblance at all to whatever any of these clients requested. Oh, says the Nat. That must be the clients. Maybe it's a request, maybe it's for, for service, maybe it's its own sessions, whatever. I didn't add it, I'm just passing it through. Ah, but if the reply is to something that was matted, it gets dropped back to the second client pool. So you actually get to combine NAT and ARP man in the middle attacks for NAT in the middle, you get to steal someone's IP. Not even steal it, just sort of assume it. Now you might say, now, 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 you said you weren't into hardcore attacks, what are you doing? I mean, come on, this, this has no legitimate purposes, right? If it, if it didn't have legitimate purposes, I just wouldn't be a very creative guy, now would I? <laughs> so check it out. Things you can do with this. Well, one nice thing you can do, and I, I you know, the, the, this is one, by the way, the, new, the code that does this is one of the few things that isn't in the tarball. It'll be in there next week. It got really fresh, don't ask. Um, basically, you can do server migrations really nicely. I was gonna say the code actually lets you um, have an individual host interject into someone else's stream. So you, aren't, you don't have a separate client, you know, other client and that box, you just have one box. So what you could do is you could have a server, so you have, you have your existing server and it's bugging out, it's getting slow or whatnot. You go ahead and you interject a new fresh server into there. But what you do is you let the existing sessions finish. In other words, you let all existing traffic go ahead and pass pass through unimpeded. But all new sessions, your new server takes. So this lets you do a graceful migration. You have two hosts with the same IP address, only one of which is accepting new sessions, and every time it accepts a new session, it goes ahead and you know, it, it takes it to its own process. But every time it sees a packet to a session that did not, that predated its own initialization, it says, ah, that must be from the old guy, 
I'll pass that over. Until eventually, and you keep track of how many sessions you're keeping for the other guy. Eventually, that number hits zero, and you get a message in your email that says, ah, everyone's moved off this server, we can you know, shut it off and fix the thing that got rooted the other day. Works for me. More ARP tricks. Is it possible to detect a single port, multi-host port scan across the switch LAN? Um, yeah, this is a word of warning for you guys. This thing right here has, is discovered like every four months for the last five years. <laughs> Basically, here's what happens. So, you know, you do a big old port scan. How? I don't know, scan random. You do a big old port scan. It hits the endpoint routers on faraway networks. But sooner or later, the, uh, you don't need to take another router. You don't need to take another hop. You don't need to take another flight. The endpoint is on your network. Well, sort of. Because you know, in a given network, there's usually lots and lots of free IPs to make room for growth, right? Well, what happens is, you know, if there's a free IP, the ARP cache on the router, the list of translations between IP addresses and MAC addresses is not going to have anything in there because there's nothing to see. So the end result being, you do a scan against 256 hosts, only 40 are up, you have at least 216 ARPs that flood a network. And the ARPs are broadcast. The, you know, hey, who has this IP address now? Anyone? Anyone? Um, so the end result being scan ran to into sparsely populated networks creates an ARP flood. And even though as an individual client you can't see your neighbor's scan, you can see the upstream router go ahead and look for other hosts. Um, I repeat, this is discovered like every three or four months. I was the latest to discover it, so you know, we'll be. Raw network access, LinkCat. LinkCat's a really, really simple tool. It came about because I'm like, wow, you know, this, this packet coding, I mean, I can do it now, but I probably would have struggled with it, like, I don't know, a little while ago. But I've always been able to play with text, so let's go ahead and make an interface between, like, text, I just, you know, type out keys or copy and paste, and the wire, you know, so I can, like, you know, read packets and just rewrite them out. And it, you know, works over SSH and whatnot. So what kind of things can we do with LinkCat? One thing is we can just run strings on the network. Is anyone, let me familiarize you guys with strings. Strings is basically a tiny little tool that looks at, a, looks at an arbitrary string of bytes, just data, and says, could a human possibly read this? Okay, then I'll dump it. And if it's just random noise, the system goes, uh, yeah, I'm not printing that out. So basically, you can just run strings on a network, just straight up. We're the first to do this. Kismet has this functionality. A couple others do. But it's a nice way to say, look, sometimes you really do care who's talking to who. You know, sometimes you care what the heck they're saying, regardless of who they are. You don't need LinkCat to do strings. If you just set TCP dump dash w dash, and you expand the snap lens, so it picks up the entire packet, and you run that through strings, you get the same result. Little uh, word though, um, human readable. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that says BSD. You can think, uh, you can think IBM for that in like 1984. <laughs> Somehow they decided that'd be a reasonable encapsulation method. I don't know. <laughs> Packet Zen 2. Ping over copy and paste. So let me show you what's kind of happening here. I'm kind of afraid to get near the speaker. I'm going there slowly. If it gets loud, I'll, I'll run. So, if you look at this blue text up here, I go ahead and I run this ping command to news.com. The blue text is the actual packet that gets sent by my machine. As you see, it's just a string of bytes. Indeed, here at the end, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, ping payloads are very often just sequential numbers. It depends on the operating system, the implementation, and you know whether you particularly put something nasty in there. But basically, whatever is in here gets reflected down here. In green, I have the reply. Now that's... I see, I needed to shut up. So, that's the basic. 
you know, I, I did a ping, that's what came on screen. Now I go ahead and I copied into my, just my clipboard, I copied what was up here in blue, the request. So I go ahead and I paste what's in blue. That's you see what you, and now it's in black. I just pasted these things, you know, just edit, copy, paste. In blue, you see what's on the network. In green, you see the reply to a ping that came from a cut and paste. So this is just a really nice, trivial method to go ahead and manipulate packets on networks. Ah, let's move up a little. Scan rate observations. Um, scan rate is a high speed port scanner and route tracer. It's got this stateless design. The sender and the receiver don't need to be the same host. I'm not going to repeat last year's talk on this, but basically, scan rate is pretty cool. Big deal is A, really fast, B, it doesn't just do port scans, it also does trace routes, and C, it does port scans and trace routes at the exact same time. Oh, and indeed, okay, this is cool. The TTL issues. Scanrand is actually able to estimate how far away a host is using its TTL. Now the TTL is actually a field that everybody's writing papers about recently. Um, the TTL is basically, it starts from some fixed value, usually, 32, 64, 128, or 255. We're talking about about 95% chance, um, and it's because programmers really love powers of two. Um, if you receive a packet with a TTL of 52, can anyone guess how far away that packet was? 64 minus 52, 12. 12 hops away. Now if you notice that with, with, the, with an average maximum hop count that you'll see being around 30, there's no overlap. If you get a packet with 33, a TTL of 33, it probably started out with a TTL of 64. If you get a packet with a TTL of 16, it probably started out with a TTL of 32. So you're actually able, just by receiving a packet, to passively estimate how far away it came from. Again, I'm not the first person to discover this. POP has this, GFI Landguard has this, and so on. Who doesn't have this, and really needs to, is Gnutella. Here you have these networks where lots and lots of hosts are making mass networks of connections to each other. Gee, Maybe it'd be nice if in their graph optimization phase, they looked at how far each individual node was and tried to go ahead and minimize distances, thus minimizing the maximum amount of traffic on the network. Thus far, this hasn't been done. It hasn't been done because I've been too lazy to finish the API so you can just run a stupid little command and it says, oh, on this session, it's eight hops away. It's coming. You know, the, the, the API is a struggle, but it's actually, you know, we've got a library now, it's actually usable, like, you know, you still have, the, the last time I talked about an API, it was like, hi, we're an API for ScanRand. Now we actually have a nice general purpose API for unified packet manipulation. You receive your packets, you send them at layer two, and you send them at layer three, and it's just sing, you know, 10 characters of C code. Nice, very simple. I, I, I'm, I'm not bragging, okay, I'm bragging. But I'm just saying this because I'm really happy to finally have a decent way to program network code. Um, oh, the other thing that TTLs do, and this is you're about to see examples of this, is TTLs let you um, see when people are playing some interesting games with the network. Now, I, of course, note this because I play interesting games with the network, and the TTL exposes me left and right. But it also exposes some other people, like uh, at a previous Black Hat conference. I, you know, was testing scanner and making sure my stuff worked before I, you know, ran off. I'm like, oh, okay, so my host is 19 hops away. Except port 25. Somehow my mail server has teleported 15 hops closer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a second, Microsoft has switched to Argo's off mail server. What, they fired the exchange group? <laughs> <laughs> you wish. <laughs> no, um, basically the hotel we were at, we were, we, they were hijacking all outgoing mail and running it through their own mail server. Now you can say this was legitimate, you know, yeah, 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 trying to block spam, yeah, yeah. Um, but there was no warning, no information about this, and um, I don't know, some minutes later there was no server left. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I really shouldn't have told him. Anyway. <laughs> Take the bet. <laughs> so, you know, point being, if you're, run, if you're running some... No, no, here's a question. Why is it that when they hijacked my mail server, 
How come they couldn't know what TTL to put in so that I'd think there was nothing wrong? Can anyone make a guess? Because every host is different. Every host is a different distance away. If I had just connected to 25 here, then what would have happened? Well, I, they would have had been like, well, uh, how do we know how far away this host really is? They have no way of finding out. So this ends up being a nice thing about TTLs. Every time someone hijacks your connection, they have a real difficult time figuring out what the TTL should be. So if you have a circumstance where you have a simultaneous side-by-side -side hijack and non-hijack, it really sticks out. So, hop count desync. This is another, this is a sort of obscure situation. I'm scanning my home network. And I'm like, wait, why is my host three different hop counts away? Well, so we've got a PIX firewall at home. Incidentally, I live behind like two PIX firewalls, so the, the end result is that I thought the internet didn't support IP options. This fucked. <laughs> um, yeah, I was getting moved out. Cool. Now that's a good point. You can go ahead and actively generate, co generate connections. The problem is, now you have showing up in logs all over the place, hey, you know, we got a session that started and immediately stopped. You know, the, you, that's the problem you have. Yes, you can go ahead, start up the session, and then you know, hijack all traffic, but you can't have it both ways. You can't both hijack it and allow the payloads to pass through. Does that make sense? Okay, so what he's saying, for, you know, I have this great sign here that says, please repeat the question. He's pointing out that what an attacker can do, you know, what the hijacker can do, is they go ahead, they see you with this packet, they go ahead, they initiate a connection to the legitimate host, not even necessarily on the same port, not even necessarily the same protocol. They go ahead, they find out the distance, comes back, and, you know, shows you... You know, the exact distance that you expect it. This is actually a very good way around it. This is the attack. It is actually mildly difficult to do for reasons of latency and sheer complexity. You have to go ahead and add raw packet handling code to your arbitrary hijacker. But it's an excellent solution to the problem. Over? Is that you? Yeah. What's up? Okay, let me, let me hit that second one first. First of all, even if your mail server and web server are hosted by different machines, they also have different IP addresses and DNS names. Usually they are not gonna go ahead, take all their mail traffic, receive it at their network, and then proxy it somewhere else. This is not a common arrangement. Usually you have, you know, www.site.com posting, going to one IP address, and www, and then mail.iphost.com going to somewhere else. Now the other thing, what was the other, what was your first point? Well, I'm just pointing out, when you connect to a single IP and you get multiple vastly different hop counts, you aren't going to get dynamic routing situations where you have, say, you know, a differences of you know, 5, 10, 15 hops. You'll get one, two, or three hops. Or, or, or else the dynamic routing situation is completely, completely off base. Um, anyway, we'll, just, we'll, we'll talk about this later, actually. Bring this up uh, after the entire session, by the way. And we're actually having a microphone on it. Um, hop count desync. This is basically saying Pix will go ahead. When Pix blocks a packet, it basically does a reflection. Swaps the ports around, swaps the IP around, and it doesn't do anything to the TTL. Result, packet decrements all the way there. Packet decrements all the way back. So that's why you have 22 as the hop count on all those down ports when the actual distance is 11 hops away. What are these POP12 ones? Those are the actual, the actual host is not listening, as opposed to the PIX is blocking any traffic. Serverless NAT identification. This 
doesn't work so often anymore. Sorry guys. Um, basically ICMP errors contain a full copy of the IP packet that elicited them. Uh, Old NATs used to go ahead and only translate the IP address, not the IP packet contained within the ICMP error. So you'd go ahead and you do a trace route, and as you see on the second packet here, go, go ahead, we have our actual external IP address. This was a nice remote serverless way of figuring out where your NAT was uh, actually showing you on the outside world. But really, like we just ran a huge number of tests, it doesn't work that much anymore. Multi-home node detection. This is cool. This, this was actually a challenge put to me, and I don't know, I sat and hurt my head for a while, and next thing you know, got it working. Is it possible to detect clients that are directly connected both to the internet, in both the internal firewall LAN and the outside world? Bad people, bad, bad network design. You got an open hole past all the firewalls. Is it possible to detect it? Yeah, yeah, check out how you do it. So, you have a corporate LAN, See, no, I'm actually talking about security stuff here. Not just, break, not, not just playing with blankets. Um, ScanRand has the neat little thing of it can actually run with separate senders and receiver processes. It's stateless in the sense that, yeah, there's, there's really no connection between the part that spews traffic on the network and the part that sees whatever the heck just came back. So let's talk about your firewall network. Your firewall network should never, on the inside, receive a scan from the outside world. That just shouldn't happen, because it should get stopped on the outside firewall, right? That should. Let's talk about what actually happens if the packets magically appear on your internal network with source IPs outside. Well, let, let, you know, think about it for a second. So uh, your entire network gets scanned with a source IP outside your network. Well, the replies have to go somewhere. They start going outside your network. But they get stopped at the firewalls because if you have any kind of decent firewall, the firewall is going to say, wait a second, all of these synacts, all of these connection accepted or connection rejected messages, I'm not supposed to send these. I, uh, this is to the outside world. What's going on here? So it drops them. Ah, but let's say you've got a host that's dual connected, that's only routing to the internal LAN, you know, you know one interface takes, uh, takes all the IPs that the corporate LAN has, and one interface has the nice access to the outside world. Well, it goes ahead and it receives this packet. It happens to be on the router interface, on the internal interface, but for the most part, they don't care. And then they need to send this reply. They go, okay, let me look at my routing table. My routing table says, when I reply to the outside world, I don't go in the direction of the firewall. I go in the direction of my DSL line. That's really a bad idea for me to have. So that's how you go ahead and you very simply detect whether someone's got a multi-home network that's completely evading your firewalls. And this may not even be malicious. This may simply be a misconfiguration. Keep in mind, a router is just another multi-home network, or multi-home node. This is my idea. Did Cheswick come up with this as well? Yeah, I think you Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Avaya used to be loosened. That's why he said that. Whatever, it's a port scan. <laughs> I, I don't know what to say. Like, you know, hey, there's a port scan. How do you detect if a firewall is, you know, whatever, it's a port scan. I believe that before the patent was the idea of spoofing the source address. Oh, wow, spoofing a source address. That's, you know, we, we, we're talking about patent stuff. Let's not get into that. I'm, here, I'm an engineer. I'm here to show off cool tricks. <laughs> what about if there's a NAT? There's a NAT involved, what do you do? Well, if there's a NAT involved, TCP traffic might have a problem because the NAT itself is not gonna wanna be passing out these synax because that's not really what NATs do. So you've got a couple possibilities, none of them really good. One of them is you go ahead and instead of sending out a whole bunch of TCP packets with spoofed IP addresses, you send out a bunch of pings with spoof IP addresses. And you see if the NAT will go ahead and pass out a ping reply without caring about anything. Odds are low, but 
non-zero, whereas they are pretty much zero for passing out a sin act. Um, where do you go ahead and you put the, now there's a problem, your source IP gets mapped to whatever the NAT had. So where do you put your internal IP that you scanned? You go ahead and you shove it into the ping header. Um, UDP is a better solution because UDP is symmetric and a node can't detect whether or not a packet is a request or a reply. The problem is the availability of something like a UDP ping is relatively weak. Um, SNMP kind of works but isn't massively deployed. Um, SMB is massively deployed but is blocked on a lot of DSL providers. So just a specific UDP ping over spoofed on 137 might not actually traverse the, net, the external network link. NAT is not a good thing. You shouldn't have this NATed box, but it's less bad because you know, ultimately the NATs rarely go ahead and allow incoming access. So it's a firewall. It's a weaker firewall. It's a violation of policy, but it's a less onerous situation than if there's just an open pipe to the outside world through a routed machine. So the state of state. Let's talk about the design of ScanRAN for a moment. First of all, ScanRAN was just an experiment. Like, seriously, you know, I didn't intend it to become this really popular tool. Um, ScanRAN is able to acquire a massive amount of data, and really it doesn't care about anything besides what it picks up on a per packet basis. Um, it doesn't care, but us as users, as humans, we do. The state's maintained by the fact that text gets printed out and it doesn't go away, it doesn't erase itself. When we saw that slide that showed, you know, hey, 19, 19, 19, 19, 4, Scanrand had no idea that there was any difference between the 19 and the 4. It was just spinning things out. But you know, it's like, it's like a TV. A TV spits electrons onto a single phosphor at a time. It goes across, it goes across, it goes across. We as humans integrate it. Well, we in the fact that the phosphorus have a delay, but let's not go into that. So the point being is that a single stream that the system sees as just one dot or one unit, we as humans can integrate. So this is cool, but I've wanted to actually be able to do more integration than I can easily do. Check out this. Now, I didn't come up with this technique, but it's interesting. TCP as a protocol has a bunch of different traits to it. One of them being is that broken connections will be repaired. If there's a packet with a bad checksum, it'll be handled. If there's a packet that's out of order, it will be moved back into order. If a packet is dropped, the TCP system will detect that and it'll retry. It's very similar to being on the phone. You know, someone drops out and you're like, hello, hello, hello. But how many hellos do you say? How long do you wait in between the hellos? The specifications say you have to go ahead and have this delay, you know, this delay and try over and over, but they don't say what precisely the delay must be. And as frankly Sat determined with Ring, this varies from platform to platform. So can we do this with ScanRand? Yeah. We can do this with ScanRand 1.1. This is where actually I'm demoing here. Um, so ScanRain, when, when you receive a SYNAC, a SYNAC is connection accepted. You're, the other side's expecting to get an acknowledgement. Okay, let's start our session. If it doesn't hear anything, it's just going to keep on sending SYNACs. Now, luckily, your kernel is going to go ahead and you know, see this SYNAC and be like, um, I didn't send you a SYN. Reset. Go away. So usually this is good because it cuts off a flood. But for this analysis, this temporal fingerprinting, as Frank called it, um, I might be mispronouncing his name, but sorry about that. Um, for the temporal fingerprinting, we want that flood of Synax. We want every Synax it can send us, because that tells us, without looking at anything individual to a packet, what operating system is sending it to us. So the solution I came up with is simply just use a different IP that the kernel's not listening on. However, because I was too lazy to go ahead and actually have ScanRAN handle MAC addresses, this is 1.1 and it was very hard back then, um, just have the kernel serve the Mac. And you can do that. There's a command in ARP. You make a static mapping, I map 10.01.190 to this Mac address, and then I have a little thing that says pub. It says if anyone else is looking for this, I got the answer. I'll go ahead and answer it for you. Does this kind of feature why uh, my man in the middle attacks kind of work? Um, 
So what happens, you go ahead, you tell 101190 is actually coming to this machine, you fake a scan from 101190, and what do we see here? Well, 101112 gets packets that get synaxed to me in zero, well, 0.2 seconds, and then, point, and then three seconds later, and then six seconds later. From experience, I know this is Windows. Same with 101136. You know, at 0 0.7, and then almost exactly three seconds later, 3.6. Almost six seconds later, 9.6. That's also a Windows machine. Ah, but now at the end, we go ahead and we look and we see, what's this, a plus four, a plus six, a plus 12, a plus 24? This machine spent 46 seconds trying to send me a Cenac? Yeah, that's a Linux box. It's pretty, uh, pretty hardcore. So, how can I start being able to move this network move towards a model where I can go ahead and um, do this kind of stuff. Well, I would basically introduce a database. But not the normal way. I'm not dealing with the APIs. I'm not going ahead and tying myself hardcore to one engine. I've been using standard out for a while. Databases, almost all of them like SQL. Well, it's dumb SQL. <laughs> Um, standard out is the ultimate database abstraction layer for entering data into a database. But getting it out, not so much. But getting it in, you use SQL, it's like CSV Pro. <laughs> I mean, really, it's just, you know, insert into foo values, or insert into table name values, big old CSV, comma, separated values, and parentheses. And that's it. So you, you can run it over SSH. You run ScanRand, tell it to output to SQL, pipe into a remote process, you know, SSH, use that host, MySQL foo, just dumps into a remote database over an encrypted link. Very nice. There is a risk if you go ahead and you do that. And the risk is if someone actually breaks the remote ScanRand process, they're able to do certain types of SQL injection attacks. In other words, they, you, you're trying to inject SQL and they're like, yeah, that's nice. Um, I'll take root. So um, yeah, it, it, the, the eventual mode will be I'll dump raw binary values with a fixed length and you'll locally parse them back into SQL. But the build you have now will go ahead and do scanner and I think it's mode one. That'll go ahead, you do a scan, it dumps it into a SQL schema which you can actually have it output. It'll output the MySQL version of it. So, how would you do something like OS fingerprinting? First of all, the right way to do OS fingerprinting is to use Ofer's new stuff. No, I, I'm serious. Like, Ofer's gone ahead and, like, done the real work. Like, my stuff was just an experiment. Ofer's gone ahead and, like, really busted it out for XPro. I've been pretty impressed with everything I've heard about it. But, you know, if you actually want to see what kind of... Re my focus is how can we do this stuff in, like, a minute. Whereas every other approach is going to be more reliable, but it's going to take longer. And actually, the other advantage is, you know, his stuff can be done now. My stuff, later. <laughs> um, so basically what you do is you identify a set of packets that elicit a uniquely identifiable host. They elicit an identifiable host. For example, Nmap has, I don't know, eight or ten packets that it sends a host that have various quirks to them. You send them all, and you see what you get back. X probes the same way, or maybe use the temporal fingerprinting algorithm. Then you go ahead, you do a blast on everyone. And then you have three, po three possible results from your blast. You have hosts that have no replies, in which case after 10 packets, the host is probably down, especially if you were mixing it up in terms of where, which host you were attacking at one time. Excuse me, scanning at one time. Um, there's all replies. You got everything you needed, now you can go ahead and run your analysis based off the results of the database. Or there's some. You got some replies, but not others. That means packets were probably dropped. So now you go ahead and you create a list where you have some, where the count is wrong, and you, big surprise, you go ahead and you scan those hosts again. So you basically get a situation where you run a first pass, you get 98%. You run a second pass, you're at 99.9. .9. You run a third pass, you're eventually at 100. Eventually it collapses on that. Of available hosts, and that is. This really works for systems where you actually have a large number of inputs. The temporal fingerprinting involves a single SIN. A single SIN getting dropped, you know, it's binary. Either you got all of them or you got none of them. So, I mean, this is the direction that I'm personally moving in towards of OS fingerprinting, but absolutely, Ofer's work is where to go for this in the long run. Ah, finally, I get to talk about the real good stuff. How much time do I got here? I 
Okay, excellent. So remember all those windows down there? You're about to see why they're open. <laughs> TCP spoofing. Normally you cannot spoof TCP traffic. In other words, you connect to a web server, some random host can't just start sending traffic to you saying, yeah, 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 this is uh, Yahoo's web page. Um, here you go. I've never seen anything from you, but here's Yahoo's web page. Now, why can't you do that? I mean, yeah, you've got your source ports that have to align. You have your IPs that have to align. The attacker that's blindly spoofing has to actually know you made the request. And you also have these values called sequence numbers that, you know, back in the day I was using them for ScanRAN, but their actual, one of their actual legitimate uses is you go ahead and if someone sends you traffic, it needs to match IP, it needs to match port, it needs to match this 32-bit sequence number that was randomly placed. The port number was not randomly placed. Port numbers generally increment sequentially. The sequence number used to not be randomly placed. <laughs> then Nichols and Lukeski went ahead and showed what happens. Um, I went ahead and, you know, one of the tools in Paketo, I'm not going to show it here, but it's really cool, it's called Fentropy, does an implementation of Zalewski's face pace algorithm. And if you've ever seen the really pretty pictures of, like, I don't know, uh, grids and floaty shapes, yeah, that was Fentropy, and that was showing off. Uh, Here's how you can visually see this ain't random. So, I mean, ever since Zalewski's paper came out, people have actually been using pretty decent algorithms for determining the randomness of their sequence number. Um, so you can't just guess it. So if I, you know, if someone wants to just spoof traffic at me, they can't figure, you know, they can't just guess what to send me. But what if the server I was talking to actually told this other machine, hey, you know what, uh, he's using this sequence number in this port. Go, go get him. You could do something really cool. I call it bandwidth broker. Is it possible for a single host to do load balancing across nearly arbitrary network boundaries without any special code on the client? There is code on the server and on what becomes now the redirector, but not the client. And the answer is yeah. What you do is you have the server be a mere redirector of client-provided packets. You have actual traffic being served by one of any number of anonymous servers that are out there that happen to be running code that translates their outgoing packets. Now, to go ahead in some detail about what happens. I'm a client. I think I'm talking to some server. I'm actually talking to a redirector. I send my packets to the redirector. What's the first thing it does? It says, I don't want any of this. I'll go ahead and I'll pass it off to some server out there based off some rule that's consistent within the session. A stateless rule, the TCP source port, consistent throughout the entire session. Same with the IP address. That's implemented today. Stateful rules, who's serving the most number of people? That's not. Um, first thing I do is I go, you know what? Let me explain this in something that might make more sense. You're the President of the United States and you still receive email at president at whitehouse.gov. You receive email, you don't want to go ahead and write all any replies. And you know, you don't also, you also don't want to do form letters, but you want to go ahead and actually have somebody look at this, intern, and you know, they'll write the reply and they'll forge your name. So you, as the citizen, send mail to the president. The president passes it off to one of a thousand anonymous interns that you'll never see on CNN. The intern goes ahead and sends you back a letter signed, the president. That's exactly what I'm doing here. I have a redirector that receives the traffic that is actually trusted by the client by its name or IP address. There's a whole horde of IP addresses out there of servers that when they serve this traffic, they will reply as if they were the redirector. And the last phase is that the acknowledgments, the thank you for this traffic, actually comes to not the anonymous servers, but to the redirectors. Why is this nice? Because now the redirector can go ahead and monitor the quality of service. Without actually sending any data, he can see how much data is sent. This is because of a quirk in TCP where after the initial sequence number is set, and after the initial the, the acknowledgement numbers are set, they advance in order of the amount of traffic being sent. So what happens is, without actually, you know, somebody, the anonymous server sends the client, 
20,000 bytes, the next packet that goes to the redirector has an acknowledgement of plus 20,000. So advantages we can do, global load distribution, yada, yada, central traffic monitoring, yada, yada, yada. Session migration, not implemented yet, but the redirector can see, oh, this, this mirror sucks. You ever gone to sites and they show you this you know, list of mirrors and you have to pick one? This annoys me. My model is you, know, you have somewhere out there is somebody who can afford more bandwidth than this administrator. Okay, so what should happen is they should be able to register and say, hey, guess what? I'm going to go ahead and I'll serve your data for you. Send me the request. You don't have to serve them. I'll pretend I'm you. Because I've got spare bandwidth and I'm willing to sell it. Maybe I'll do it on a ratio system. I don't know. But the end result being individual servers go ahead and spoof each other because for arbitration purposes. And uh, it's, it's all completely decentralized. Now, there are systems that do some stuff like this. You know, Akamai and Altion have similar stuff, but it's very odd. For the most decentralized technology that you can really imagine, they're completely centralized. Every time you want to do anything like that, you go and you have something in their property and their network do it. Whereas a much more efficient way would be we can you know, have anyone you want spoof your traffic. Here's a small little module that modifies your outgoing packet so they look correct. Now, this works for everything. It works for every kind of TCP stuff, you know, MP3 radio stations, web servers, etc. The redirector does have a traffic load, but it's relatively small. Now, now comes the scary part, because now I'm actually going to demo this stuff. So, I have no idea if this is going to work. Oh, good. So I have like eight of those things open. You know what? We're not, we're, so we happen to have Squid running on our redirect. Go ahead. Yes. This only makes sense for situations where the server to client traffic is a lot heavier than the client to server traffic. Which act, okay, so what he said is, you know, this redirector has to receive all the traffic from the client. And not only does it have to receive it all, it has to send it. Now how many people here in this room have ADSL connections at home? You notice how your connection can send data, can receive data a lot faster than it can send it? It's because a, most of the systems on the net actually require much faster download rates than they require upload. It's very much the same with the redirector. The redirector does indeed have a bandwidth hit, but it's something like 20 to 1, 30 to 1, 40 to 1 savings. So it does have a hit in order to you know, tell someone else to go ahead and do it. It's like the Simpsons line, can't someone else do it? Uh, <laughs> It does take a hit, but it's, you know, it's meaningless. It's standing around versus actually lifting something. So as opposed to just talking about this stuff, I'm actually going to try to give a demonstration. And I'm going to show off how um, stuff actually works. So it's going to require me to find the right RxVT window of many, so you'll have to wait one second. Hmm, wait till you see that. It's not that. This is absolutely not the, there we are. So, this redirector, the home redirector, I call it Homer. Homer goes ahead, we even just run the uh, help thing for you to see. Homer goes ahead and it is gonna forward 10,080 and 20,080. This is Linux only for now because I'm using part of the libipq library, the IP tables, which actually is pretty cool. I'm gonna forward 10,080 and 20,080 to a non-serve one, a non-serve two, and a non-serve three. This machine has like a third of a DSL one, a third of a T1. This thing has no bandwidth available to it. The other machines are a bit better off. So let's see if I can go ahead and get Winamp to, this happens to also be known as music.spare.com 10,080. Now, this is digitally important. Why did I have digitally imported? Because um, it's very actually nice to code to something that um, when you break your code, your music stops. So you're really motivated to fix your code quickly. Now if you go ahead and you look, that redirector right there, I mean, this machine is not participating in the data transmission. But it is seeing, ah, okay, 
581 kilobytes have been sent at 17k a second. Now let's go ahead and switch servers. The algorithm used right here is quite simple. It's just basic, straightforward. Is what's your source port? If it's you know divisible by you know mod three, so just each one just, it just cycles up. So every time I hit plus, it's going to go to a different server. So now you see this second session has popped up. And it's now being served off of 64, 60, 246, 202, which is actually, should be speaking down here. So you see this window right here. Now this host is actually serving the data. Meanwhile, my machine thinks it's getting all this data from this redirector. The redirector doesn't have the traffic, the ability to support any of this. We run it a third time. And actually, that should have been a third server. Oh, well, one of the servers is on the blank. Oh, well, it happens. So the end result of all this is that we can go ahead and we can actually, hang on. I have one last thing I want to show before I move on to the demo. I have no idea if it's actually going to work. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. So that's how you go ahead. The the idea is that you don't go ahead and change anything in the packet that says, hey, you know, I wanted you to actually, I want you to change your source port when you send this packet to XYZ. Now, the reason I don't want to do that is because I don't want to expand the packet in any way. Because if I expand the packet, I might receive a packet to forward that's already at its maximum size. Now I'm in fragmentation hell. This is not good. So to avoid fragmentation hell, you basically preset your mappings between an incoming port and an outgoing source IP to translate into. So just to show off, Really, there's no other reason I'm doing this. This is just total bragging. This might work. Yeah. Packetmon off a web page. See, there was a reason I brought that up. Oh, hang on. This is not working because it actually wants to know the interface. Uh, that would be here. Now, as you see, oh wow, am I getting like everyone's traffic here? Okay, I'll have to set up some rules. <laughs> yeah, that's wireless. <laughs> the big <laughs> back to the hub design. Woohoo! All right, now this thing's actually really cool. Capture only packets that match. New rule. I never actually used this functionality, so you'll have to. Bear with me. Here we are. IP header contents, numeric test. Actually, it's a TCP header content. Do we have TCP support here? Oh, well, we don't. Here, I'll find something that's from 1080. Maybe it'll sort. Yeah, it will. This thing's like 100 kilobytes, and it works on a stock machine. That's pretty cool. All right, so you see this IP address, 216.64.174.1. This is sending nothing. This has no link to this session. But the data is actually coming from, what is it? 65197.14669. This machine's happy. It's, um, I don't know. It's gonna sound, sound better. See, playing music just fine. Sounds like crap, should've sounded better, but oh well. So yeah, this is one of those things I have no idea what people are going to do with it. Everything from doing distribution of your databases to doing migrations to serving music. There's a squid server running on 20,080. It just goes ahead and every single connection comes from a different IP address. A little note to, your web, to the web developers out there, do not presume one IP address to one client because with this squid hack you'll have three IP addresses, four IP addresses, 20 IP addresses, but it's the same client. Now go ahead and ask your question. How so? Oh, you mean the, uh, the traffic from the redirector? So I would be worried about a um, So the question is, can the path between the redirector and the anonymous server be encrypted? 
It can, but I'd almost wonder why, because the traffic coming into the redirector itself is unencrypted. So if you have one segment of the network that's secure and another segment of the network that's insecure, you still have this big insecure segment. If you want security, this works just fine with encryption being run end-to-end. -end. It'll still redirect end-to-end -end traffic. And the next thing I'm showing off is going to work with this. This is going to be the demo. I have no idea if it's going to work. All right. So that was bandwidth brokering. This. This I finally got working. I'm so excited. Got this working like four days ago. It's like ruined by sleep since. That whole need to polish thing. Anyway, SSL versus IDS. This is like the eternal conflict of security right now. Okay, that's not true. There's no shortage of eternal conflicts. This is just one of many. All right, so SSL annoys me. Why does SSL annoy me? Well, SSL uses certificates. And unlike pretty much any other certificate-based protocol, if I get your certificate today, it's game over. Not game over like your present session is hacked into. Not game over like your future sessions are hacked into. It's game over like all the traffic you've been sending for the last year exposed. All the traffic you send a year from now exposed. This is really bad and is relatively unprecedented for any kind of link layer, pro link based encryption protocol. Now I went ahead and I harassed one of the authors of SSL and uh, to be blunt, he put me right in my place. He said, look, it was 1996, we had 1.5% of the available CPU power at the time. And yeah, we've got more power now, but the internet's a little bit bigger than it was in 1996. And that being said, here's this screwed up mode to SSL that fixes it, but no one's ever gonna use it. I'm like, wow, that's what you get when you go to the author. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, there's a slash that our interview with one of the authors of SSL. He basically describes a mode where you renegotiate your certificate after you basically do the short, the long term, and then a, either a Diffie Hellman inside or you can use another certificate. But it's not enabled by default. And no, to anyone who wonders, ephemeral RSA isn't going to cut it, it's so 512 bits, and you can't increase it, the browser's complaining. Yes, I tried. Um, just doing that. So SSL annoys me because it's as a as a crypto protocol, it fails really, really catastrophically when it fails in this mode. IDS also annoys me. IDS annoys me because you know, hey look, we're gonna do attack. Cool. That just bothers me. Like, if you're not going to do anything about it, why are you wasting all this time finding out? It's just like you're wasting sleep. <laughs> like, oh my god, we're under attack. You do anything about it? Hello? <laughs> but the conflict between the two is what really annoys me. I, I respect people who like both. I respect people who use both. But the conflict is annoying. So IDS, how does it work? It sits in between your, the clients and the servers. It sits on the network and it watches the traffic. What is the basic presumption of IDSs? Your servers are too stupid to manage their own security. Th that's what it is. It says, this, if, if these servers could handle it all by themselves, you wouldn't need something on the network that was looking into everything, seeing if it would cause the server to fall over. Because the servers wouldn't fall over. The basic presumption of IDS then is that servers are broken. Now what does SSL go ahead and do? SSL goes ahead and says, oh my god, the network is broken. There's all these hosts that are sniffing and watching and are going to break in. And what does SSL do? SSL encrypts it so that only the client and the server can see what's actually going on. So here you have IDS saying servers are dumb and SSL saying networks are dumb. And you can't have both. You're, you're left with this choice. You either have to suppress passive attacks by using, um, by using uh, IDSs, but then you suffer active attacks. In other words, all the web kitties who go ahead and the first thing they do is they look on a server and say, oh, I can come in through, uh, through the SSL port. Get out of IDS free card, score. Um, that's one opportunity. Or you have to suppress the active attacks, you know, 
forget it, you know, we're going to go ahead and we're going to watch you on the IDS. But now you have to suffer the passive attacks. All these other people on the network who are watching. This choice isn't very good. I don't like that. So, how is this normally solved? Because there's a long history of people trying to solve this badly. One way is you just transfer the certificate to the IDS. Yeah, you have like 20 SSL servers in your network. You have one box with 20 certs, by the way, which by every rule of crypto, should, the private search should never ever move. This is the biggest target you could possibly have. And as I explained earlier, when SSL dies because its certificate got lost, it really, really dies. Plus, it add, you have to do RSA decryption on the IDS. IDSs aren't bulging at the seams with extra CPU cycles, okay? You don't want to be tr tacking on RSA to that as well. Now you can do this today. There's this tool called SSL dump, written by Eric Rascorla, who if he didn't partially write the spec, sure as hell knows a massive amount about it. He's the author of the definitive book on SSL, called SSL and TLS. I had nothing to do with it, but the book's great. Oh yeah, uh, plug, book signing, yeah. Uh, yeah, stealing the network and, uh, I don't know, all of you have a copy of one of my books, the hack-proofing thing. There, plugs out of the way. Um, SSL dump can be pressed into service today to do this. And a couple IDSs have gone ahead and implemented that. You give it your cert if you're an idiot and you go ahead and the IDS can read your traffic. Um, another approach is to go ahead and you mix IDS with inline SSL accelerators. Turns out, if you go ahead and you scan ran Google, on port 80 and 443. There's an extra hop that it takes on 443. Why is that? Because that's their SSL accelerator. They have a box that all it does is it decrypts traffic. What you basically do is you go ahead and you connect to the, you have users connect to the decryptor, which then either directly forwards traffic to the IDS or the IDS just sits in the middle, and then the server just re receives nice clean plain text. There are issues, to say the least. First of all, the servers never see cryptography, so they can't make decisions based on client certificates. Somebody told me about this yesterday, and I should have realized this myself. It's absolutely true. Um, there's issues with HTTP rewriting. There's massively issues with other kinds of protocols. Um, and it puts plain text on a wire. You've done all this work to go ahead and get end-to-end -end cryptography, and right before the end, you cut out. That's not good. So, wow, I really should have broken this slide down. All right, let's talk about how SSL works. You don't go ahead, you know, you have your private keys and it's all asymmetric and junk, right? Yeah, you don't use that crypto to go ahead and encrypt your entire session. Why? Because it'd be really, really slow. What you do is use this asymmetric crypto, a piece where, you know, everyone can encrypt but only one person can decrypt. You use that to go ahead and negotiate a per session what's called a master secret. And this per session master secret is unique every single time, and it's this that they were most paranoid about getting lost. If you look at all the documentation, it's like, if the master secret is lost, all is lost. If the master secret is lost, one session is exposed. The certificate is lost, everything dies. Okay, now this master secret that's exchanged on a per session basis, the obvious thing to do, I did this, but I mean, it's, it's obvious, and it hasn't been done before, but anyway. You just send the master secret over an encrypted channel to the IDS. That's interesting, it's good, it's what you should do, but it's not cool. What's cool is there's multiple keys in there. There's independent keys from the, of the direction from the client to the server and from the server to the client. And it turns out what you can do and what has been implemented and what should actually be a patch that is not in your tarball but is ready right now is you can just leak an individual key from the client to the server. So in other words, you're a bank. You do not trust traffic from the outside world. You are under regulations, though. You can't allow any other machine to see the traffic from the server to the client. The sensitive, personally identifying information. You've got Graham, Leach, Bliley. You've got regulations everywhere. Ah. So what do you do? You leak the key to the IDS just in a single direction, just for a single session. Anything goes wrong on the IDS, it's only getting traffic from the outside world. It's only getting a limited amount of it. Ah, and there's one last piece. It's really difficult, and it isn't working yet, but it works with bandwidth brokering. You've got a machine that's receiving all the client traffic. It 
can't decrypt the server to client traffic. It also can't see the server to client traffic, but it's able to decrypt the client to server traffic. Why is this not working immediately? Because there's some really nasty stuff going on with bandwidth brokering on the TCP level. None of the IPs align anymore. The SSL dump code had a heart attack when I started trying to make it do it. So let's see, and I don't know if I'm gonna get this to work. I really don't. Let's see if I can make this happen. Oh, actually, that's, that's the alternate, but we'll do that later. So here's that machine. Now we need to find the other machine that has SSL dump on it, which would be up here. Hello? Yeah, never ever do this. This whole live demo thing is like really stressful, because I really have no idea if this is gonna work or not. All right, so. DK. this one. I'm totally going to have to change all my certificates after this talk. I don't even want to imagine if one of you has hijacked this thing. All right, so S-Tunnel CR, uh, actually there's no user, just spare.com 25. Ah, wait. That was really cool, up to and including the moment where I got nothing there. There's something wrong here. Yeah, I really shouldn't be running this. All right, so anyway, I'm not gonna go ahead and do this live demo. You'll get the patch. But the bottom line is this. And the reason I'm not doing the live demo is the server I was about to do it on is actually moving mail traffic. So we actually, um, see where it says buy there? That, that was from an actual mail session. <laughs> hey, what can I say? I don't do live demos. Okay, so check this out. SSL dump has been modified in this patch that I've created. What SSL dump does, normally it requires the key to be, the certificate to be available. Instead, you have two SSL dump sessions. One of them goes ahead and actually has a copy of the cert. This lives on your endpoint. Eventually, SSL dump isn't there as a patched open SSL itself. What it does when, S when S SSL dump is launched is instead of just decrypting the traffic normally, it forwards the, it opens up an SSH session, like it actually prompts you for a password, opens up an SSH session to this other machine, to our IDS equivalent, and it basically opens up a socket. An SSL dump machine on that machine, an SSL dump, ah. An SSL dump process on that other machine, on the IDS, starts up, listens for the socket, receives the socket. Every time a new session is initiated, it receives the key for that session. Now, if all I, I can go ahead and I can zero out the key from an individual direction, client to server, server to client, it still works. And what happens is, just as you saw down here with it where it says buy, like basically you just get to read the traffic. And if you're an IDS developer, you go ahead and you patch that into your engine. So I really wish that could have been a live demo. I was working earlier today, but uh, yeah, I'm not gonna mess with my roommates. <laughs> now, you know, um, all this stuff is nice and cool and is really elegant, but for HTTP, I don't want to say it's unnecessary, but there's another approach you can do. And basically what you do is HTTP is inferior to sockets. I'm, you know, this is coming from someone who likes going ahead and running you know, IP over HTTP, but still, HTTP run, basically takes everything you want to say, batches it in a big bunch, and shoves it off somewhere. And then if you want to see if there's a reply, you have to continue to go, hey, hey, is there a reply? Is there a reply? Is there anything for me? Hey, hello? Um, this is inferior to sockets where you can just you know, toss bytes back and forth. When you have a web application, sooner or later, it gets this big glob of data. It doesn't matter if it came in over an SSL link. There's a blob of data you're supposed to do something with. Before you go ahead and deal with it in your web application, how about you toss it off to the IDS? Maybe even see if the IDS is happy with it. 
it works. It actually works really well. You don't have to interface with the crypto. You don't have to worry about TCP IP chicanery. You're really selective about what you want to expose or not. Anything you don't want to expose, you just like replace it with X's. It works great. What's the disadvantage? Nowhere near as cool. But it does work. And at the end of the day, you know, I'm a consultant now. I'm supposed to make things work. So, hey. So that's about all I've got to do. I've got five minutes left for questions. Um, before I start, you know, I'd like to thank Avaya. They sent me out here, been supporting all this work. And uh, that being said, hit me. Oh, and I have books and shirts and stuff to give away too. So who thinks they can hurt my head? Oh, for I know you can, well, he's gone, so. <laughs> who, go ahead. Anyone? Go ahead. Ah. The question is, what is the reliability of my type support scans? And it ends up hovering around, I don't know, it, it really depends on the network. It'll hover, if I do three scans, I'll get, I don't know, 8,000 replies in four seconds out of 65,000. And it'll vary by 100 or 200 either way. So it looks like each time you run a scan on a very nice network, you'll get about 90% coverage. Oh, accuracy in the fingerprinting. Um, you mean the temporal fingerprinting? Okay, so OS fingerprinting by the Nmap model is actually pretty accurate. Like, they're really able to go ahead and say, oh, that's a Speedstream 2300. Um, OS fingerprinting has worked pretty well in, in that model. And the temporal fingerprinting model, you're, you're just working with so little. And you know, there, there's various different tools and various different methods. The, the basic idea there is go ahead, do a mass scan, and then see what you got back, and based off what you got back, do your second pass and your third pass and so on. That's really how the design has to go. Are there any other questions? If not, thank you much.